Um, so it was, a, of course, a great wedding. But imagine how great it's going to be when the Lord returns to take his bride, the church. We have that wedding feast. And we all go off for an eternal honeymoon. It's uh, quite wonderful. And the, there are lots of uh, types or allegories in the Bible. Yeah, I'll just... I'm just trying to get my watch. Right, sorry. Lots of uh, these digital watches. Lots of uh, types and allegories in the Bible. Um, we think about the children of Israel, how they left Egypt, and that was likened unto uh, their old way of life, and for us not to go back to Egypt. And they went through the Red Sea, and the Bible says that's a, a type of baptism. And they uh, wandered through the wilderness. They were led by the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. As we are in the wilderness and we're led by the Holy Spirit, we're not uh, of this world. We don't belong here, but uh, we're led by the Holy Spirit. And we're on our way to the promised land. And when the uh, children of Israel went to the promised land, a miracle happened. They had to cross the River Jordan and the river Jordan parted, and quite a miracle. And they went across dry shod into the promised land. And when the Lord returns, it says that a miracle will happen, the heavens will depart like a scroll, and uh, we'll rise and meet the Lord in the air. And we'll go to the promised land where there will be milk and honey. And you know our natural minds can't even comprehend the spiritual milk and honey that waits for us. We're going to have a look at um, a story in the Old Testament in 1 Kings chapter 18 about the prophet of Elijah and the Baal, the Baal prophets. And really it's going to answer the, the age-old question that's probably plagued mankind for thousands of years is how do I know what the true church is. How do I know what is God's church? There's thousands of churches around. The Catholics say they're right, the Baptists, the Lutherans, the um, Pentecostals, revivalists, all say they're right, but how do we know what is God's true church? And again, this is a story that happened in the Old Testament and it's got its, its uh, fulfillment in the New Testament. It's a type it's an example, and we've got the New, uh, New Testament fulfillment, so we're going to have a look at that. And answer that question, how do we know what is God's true church? Let's go on to 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 17. The king of Israel was a guy called Ahab, and he had a wife, Jezebel, um, Probably not the ideal couple, um, either man or woman. Ahab uh, allowed Israel to worship Baal. Baal was a false god, and Israel worshipped Baal as his fathers did before him. And Elijah met him, and it came to pass in verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandment of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. So Israel was following a false god, and obviously they weren't getting blessed by God for doing it. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of the groves 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So he said, gather all Israel. Let's sort this thing out once and for all. Gather Israel and your prophets of Baal. I mean, he was slightly outnumbered. But let's go to Mount Carmel and let's sort this thing out. Let's find out what's the true God. And uh, Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, Follow him. 
But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. You know, it's made sense. Whatever's the true God, well then follow him. You're, you're undecided. You don't know. You're, you're halting with your opinions. You don't know what the true God is. And again, as we're finding out today, there's so many thousands and thousands of churches, whether they're Christian or other types of religion. But really you can you can sort of simplify it into there's only really two churches. There's the church of God, which follows the Bible, God's word, that God's in it. God's in that church. God answers prayers in that church. God does miraculous things in that church. And there's the church of mankind. There's mankind's religion, man-made religion, where God isn't in it. That's just the harsh, the harsh, cruel facts. God is not in man-made religion. In whatever form it is, whether it's Christian or other faiths, there's only one God. He has only one church. And in that church, he performs miracles. In that church, he answers by fire, as we'll see. But the man-made religion, the man-made churches, you can group them all together. And for our sake in this story, we're just going to call that the bowl the Baal religion, the Baal church, as we'll see, Jesus um, did um, describe man-made religion quite perfectly. He said, by their traditions, they've made the word of God of none effect. They've thrown out the word of God and just replaced it with their own traditions. He said, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Again, a perfect, perfect example of man-made religion, or Baal church, where God isn't in it. So Elijah said, okay, let's uh, put this to the test. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on wood and put no fire under and I'll address the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under and call ye on the name of your gods and I'll call on the name of the Lord and the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Baal was apparently a, a fire god, so this should have been right up their alley. But the God that answers by fire, the God that does a miracle where fire comes down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice, that's a miracle. You know, I've, I've placed, placed some nice ribs on my Weber altar, but I've never seen it instantaneously combust in flames without the aid of uh, some gas and fire. So this will be a miracle. A fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. And when we think of uh, sacrifice, the sort of the, the New Testament fulfillment of that is really repentance. It's where... Um, we turn away from our old way of life. We, uh, we give it up. We um, throw it away. We sacrifice it away in the hope of getting something better from God. And Paul talks about this. Let's have a look. Keep your finger in First Kings 18. We're going to keep coming back here. But again, this idea of a sacrifice, the New Testament fulfillment of that is what the Bible calls repentance. Let's go to... Uh, Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. And Paul the Apostle's talking here. In verse 4, he's talking about his, like his pedigree. He's talking about you know, his natural life on, on how uh, in the natural how good it was. It says in verse 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. I'm circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he had all these things in the natural going for him, 
Then he says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, but do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. With all these things in my natural life, I'm going to do them away. I'm going to turn away from them. I'm going to sacrifice them away that I might win Christ. And of course, that's, that's the first step of our salvation is this repentance, is to turn away from our old life that we may have a new life. And also repentance is not something you just do once as you walk on the Lord. It's something you do continually. You know, there's cases where we had uh, brothers that are good at sport and they could have done sport at an elite level, football. I do think of someone in here. Um, it's slightly better than me. But anyway, he could have done elite football, AFL level. But he decided that to win Christ was far better. You know, there's lots of these testimonies where we choose to sacrifice away something in the natural to win Christ. And Paul put this quite well here. So repentance is our first step of salvation. Let's go back to our story in First Kings. Chapter 18. So that's what Elijah said. Well, let's go, okay, let's do a sacrifice. In verse 20, uh, verse 25. So let's do a sacrifice. The God that answers by fire, let him be God. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose ye one bullock for yourselves and dress it first, be a many. And call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock, which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from the morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. Important point. There was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leapt on in the margin says they danced upon the altar which was made. You know, this was quite a show. This was quite an event. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry loud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. A bit naughty of Elijah, but you get a good point. Baal was the god of fire. But uh, nothing was happening. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manners with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice all day long. There was neither voice nor any to answer nor any regarded nothing happened a key point man-made religion nothing happens god's not in it god's not in Baal worship god's not in man-made religion that teach the doctrine the commandments of men and we hear testimony after testimony of people brought up in the Catholic Church and they're 15 and they stand before the priest and the priest says, I can play dominoes better than you can. Or something he says in Latin. But then he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost and nothing happens. And I guess as a 15-year-old, you probably haven't got the confidence, but you could say, Mate, nothing happened. Do it again. You know, the Catholic priest could all day long be saying, receive you the Holy Ghost and be dancing upon the altar and like the prophets of Baal. And in the end, nothing happens. Nothing happens. And probably the greatest tragedy in, in the, um, under Christianity is the doctrine of man that says you just have to believe. Just say the sinner's prayer and you receive the Holy Spirit. 
You can say the sinner's prayer all day long to your blue in the face. You can say it, you can dance on the altar, you can cut yourselves if you want to, whatever, whatever the Christian version of that is. We'll be all emotional. We'll be all um, moved with the, the worship of the music. And you can say the sinner's prayer, you can make a decision for Christ all day long. But in the end, there's no voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. Nothing happens. You know, and that, and that again is a treasure. I think of Pastor Paul Noble, who spent a lot of his youth in the um, Church of Christ, where he was told he was saved. No, you believe, you're saved. He never felt saved. You know why? Because he wasn't saved. It was in the back of his mind. He wanted reassurance. I need to know that I'm saved. But he wasn't, because he hasn't done it according to God's way, because God is not in man-made religion and then you know and sometimes the show of the man-made religion can be quite impressive um i wasn't around at the time but billy graham crusade i know pastor jock was around then uh billy graham crusade in the 50s when he traveled to australia and gave these amazing um, campaigns and he was a great orator and you know would get people motivated but being a great orator doesn't mean that the message you give is of god i mean adolf hitler was a great orator as well but um you know he put on a great show it was like these prophets of baal they were dancing on the altar they were cutting themselves with knives and blood was gushing out it was it was on a great show but in the end the message was come at the front say a sinner type prayer and go back to your church you know and the reason you left the church was there was nothing there and then the answer to this will go back to where there's nothing again it's a prophet of a bow type of a situation god's not in it when god's in something something's going to happen and we'll we'll read on to see what does happen so elijah verse 30 so all day long nothing happened and Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. You know, they've had years and years and years of Baal worship, and Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And think of uh, the great latter reign of the Holy Spirit that we're a part of, and of the great uh, revivals that has happened throughout the beginning of the uh, 20th century, 1900s, and of uh, the Welsh Revival, the Azusa Street Revival, and Pastor Jock and Helen, experts on this area, if you want to know more. But none of these revivals happened until there was faithful men and women that repaired the altar of the Lord. You know, They had centuries and centuries of man-made religion, of, of Baal worship centuries of it and they said you know what let's repair the altar of the lord let's go back to the bible let's see what the bible says let's look in the bible and see what god says none of these revival would have, wouldn't have happened unless those faithful men and women went back to the bible and said let's have a look see how you receive the holy spirit let's see what is the commandments of god in regards to salvation and he repaired the altar of the lord that was broken down and Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, and to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and made a trench around the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. So, again, we think of sacrifice too in the Old Testament was a way of taking away your sin, remitting your, your sin, the Old Testament way. But it, the law was perfect, as we read in the Bible, but man wasn't perfect. Man, uh, man's heart is desperately wicked, and who can know it? So the problem with this system was you had to keep on making these sacrifices because man kept on sinning. Because every year was a year of atonement, and a sacrifice would be made for the sins of the people. So Jesus came to give it a new and a living way. 
a better way, built on better covenant, better promises. So the Old Testament way of getting your sin removed was by sacrifice, but we'll look at the New Testament way. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. So Jesus came to provide a new way. God's uh, standard is still there. Be ye holy for I am holy, God says. So his, God's standard is there, but the way that we achieve this wasn't working the Old Testament. We knew what to do. We just couldn't live up to it. So we had to continually make these sacrifices. So Jesus came and led a perfect life, a sinless life. Blood still had to be shed for the remission of sins. But Jesus made one sacrifice himself. Once and for all, he made one sacrifice to perfect forever them that are sanctified. And then those that avail themselves of that sacrifice receive the Holy Spirit and your hearts change. This is how it's a new and a better way. Your heart goes from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. It goes from a wicked heart to a spiritual heart. The Holy Spirit is now inside of us now we the spirit filled you know we we keep the ten commandments we probably can't even quote them but we keep them because it's in our heart now it's a, it's a new and a better way and on the day of pentecost um after receiving the holy spirit himself peter got up and was speaking to the crowd of people around him and explaining this thing of how in verse 32 this jesus god has raised up whereof we are all witnesses, and therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. Shed forth the Holy Ghost. They were gathered around because they heard the speaking in tongues of the Holy Ghost. It goes on, for David is not extended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make my foe by foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom you crucified. Well, good one. Jesus came to save you and you were crying for his blood. And no doubt we would have been too if we were there. Who you crucified, God has made him Lord and Christ. Lord and Christ the anointer. Who anoint us the Holy Ghost. When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter, the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is a New Testament way for you to remit your sins. Repentance, baptism, the full immersion. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as they just did a few verses before speaking in tongues. And when you've done all three, then your sins are remitted. Your sins are gone, washed away. And the Lord comes back, you're ready to meet him in the air, live forever. That's the New Testament fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrifice, a new and a better way. Jesus only had to die once. And we are perfected forever through his blood. Let's go back to our story. So just recapping the story. What's the true God? Baal or the Lord God? Two sacrifices, two altars. Baal, prophets prayed for fire to come down, consume the sacrifice. Nothing happened. Elijah now, verse 33, he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood I'm just going to have a look at this four barrels four in uh, bible numerics is the earth number for example in our earth we have four directions north south east and west we have four seasons on earth, summer, winter, autumn, spring. When God was dealing with Adam in the Garden of Eden on that part of the earth, there was a river and it divided into four heads. 
the children of Israel, which the promise was that they would fill the whole earth, fill the whole earth. Um, four women gave birth to the original children of Israel. Eve, uh, she's known as the mother of all living. She's quite literally our earth mother. Her name, Eve, is mentioned four times in the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 2, it talks about the witnesses of God on earth, uh, signs, wonders, divers, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. So four witnesses on earth. So earth is the, is this, uh, four is the earth number. So we've got four barrels, or four being earth, or earthly barrels being vessels. This is the, the earthen vessels, four barrels, earthen vessels. That's us in our natural state, the earthen vessel. We're just in a natural state, we're just pots of clay. And the Bible says man at his best is just vanity. Our natural life, all we have is this natural life. And it's not very cheery because God says, dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. But there's a promise for us for earthly vessels is we can have something quite wonderful, something quite miraculous inside us, and that's a treasure, a treasure in our earthen vessel. Of course, referring to the Holy Spirit, a treasure that won't pass away, that won't, won't go back to dust, that will live forever and be a part of us as we live forever. And if we want to have this treasure in earthen vessels, then, as we said before, we, our old life, we've got to be willing to turn away, to, to put it to death, to sacrifice it away. That's the first step. That's repentance, as we talked about. And the second thing we've got to do is we've got to cover that sacrifice with water. We've got to bury it in water. And really, the New Testament fulfilment of pouring all this water, burying this sacrifice, is Water baptism. Baptism by full immersion. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. It's a type of burial, which is what baptism is. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him, with Christ, by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Henceforth, we should not serve sin. So our steps of salvation, repentance, we turn away from our old man, our old life. We actually put him to death. He's crucified with Christ, and then he's buried, buried in the waters of baptism. But we don't stay buried. We have the hope of a new resurrection, of a new life, even as Christ was resurrected. So, and, of course, that was quite a miracle, that we too would be re resurrected. So if we... We want to know what the true church is, then we follow the Bible in repentance and baptism. And where the proof comes is when we're resurrected. When God does his miracle is when we're raised from the dead, as Christ was, to walk in newness of life. And as we see in our Old Testament story, let's go back to it. Quite a miracle happened. But in verse um, 34... So Elijah said, do it the second time. Pour water on the sacrifice the second time. And do it. And he said, do it the third time. And the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Now, if we want, we're an earthen vessel, we want to have this treasure that will last forever. Then repentance and baptism, and it's not a suggestion from God, it's a, it's a commandment of God. It's important. 
you know, let this be established in two or three witnesses. Jesus, when he was saying something important, well, everything was important, but when he was stressing something was really important, he'd say, verily, verily, or truly, truly. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, ye, ye must be born again. You must be born of water and of the Spirit. So that's important. It's not a, it's not a you know, do it if you want. This is a, a commandment of God. You know, and for on YouTube, you know, people here, baptism is available. You can be baptized today. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit today. In verse 35, and the water ran ran about the altar and filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. And what's the what's the New Testament time for salvation? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. As I said, you can receive the Holy Spirit today. You can be baptized today. Now is the time. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Another thing about God's true church is his servants, when they speak, God will confirm what they are saying with, with miracles, as Elijah was saying here. You know, prove to these people that I'm your servant, God, by a miracle. And let's have a look at Mark 16. Because in God's true church, God will confirm what his servants are saying with miracles. In man-made churches, what they say, the traditions of men and the doctrines of men, God doesn't confirm what they're saying. But in Mark chapter 16, we hear Jesus' last words, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall, I'll find it soon, they shall find, they shall cast out, in my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, if they drink a deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We know these scriptures well. But really, I mean, this question is, what is the true church? The really important scripture is that as it goes on, verse 19, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up to heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they, the disciples, went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. That's, that's really the key scripture here. Sometimes we focus on the other bit. But the true servants of God, the true church, God will confirm what they are saying with signs following, with miracles. Miracles of healing, miracles of even the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. God will confirm the servants what they're saying with signs following. That's what Elijah was saying here. Let's go back to First Kings chapter 18. Back to our story. So Elijah's had this prayer, and then something quite amazing happened. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Amazing miracle. The stones themselves were consumed. The fire of God fell from heaven. An amazing thing happened. Consumed this sacrifice. And that's the answer for us, of course, the New Testament fulfillment of this. is John the Baptist. He said, I indeed baptize you with water, but there come one mighty than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost 
amplifier. Now, the New Testament fulfillment of what happened here, where you can know yourself what the true church is, what the true God is, you can receive the Holy Ghost and fire. And something miraculous will happen. I mean, if you were standing there at this time and you saw that happen, it'd be a, you'd sort of, you'd know what day it was, what time it was, no doubt. You'd, you'd remember it. And even 80 years later, you remember, oh, I remember that day. It was on the 11th of January, 3.30. And the fire, Elijah prayed, the fire came down and I saw it. Something happened. You'd, you'd take note of it. And the same thing with receiving the Holy Spirit, something happens. It's not Holy Ghost isn't something that grows on you like a mold through belief. Either you've got it or you haven't got it. And, of course, we that received it know there's a specific moment in time when you didn't have it and then, bang, we received the Holy Spirit. And something wonderful happens. We'll go to Acts chapter 2. Let's check the two. Verse four. The first people that received the Holy Spirit when the day of I'll go verse one. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord, one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled or the house where they were sitting. Now, if you were a, like a reporter, a CNN reporter, and you're in that you're in that room, and you're reporting what happened, the first thing you got 120 people praying to receive the Holy Spirit. The first thing that would happen is, of course, is someone receives the Holy Spirit. Who was the first person out of the 120 to receive the Holy Spirit? The Bible doesn't say, but Someone did. And that would be the first thing, if you were there reporting that, the first thing you would notice was you would hear someone making this sound, like a rushing mighty wind, which is a great way of the Bible we're talking about, describing speaking tongues. And it was a sound from heaven. It wasn't as though you heard it from heaven. We can't hear sounds that are in heaven. But the sound came from heaven. It originated from heaven, originated from Jesus Christ in heaven, pouring out the Holy Ghost. And someone out of the 120 started speaking in tongues. And the first thing you would notice is that you would hear it, the sound of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house. You know, tongues has got that projection. It filled the whole house where they're sitting. Then, of course, you'd look around and see, where's it coming from? And verse 3 is a, it's a shocking translation by the King James. But if you go to the original Greek, it should read, and then tongues appeared. You know, you're there, you're the reporter, someone receives a spirit. You, you can't look at 120 people at once, but you hear this speaking in tongues. It's the sound of the rushing mighty wind. You look around and there you see tongues. Tongues appeared, someone speaking in tongues. And it's, cloven's the wrong word. It's in the Greek, it's divided or distributed. So like I've got some lollies, I'm going to divide them amongst my friends. One for you, one for you, two for me, whatever. But this tongue was divided or distributed like a fire. So that person, you know, if you're reporting, be like, I heard this sound like rushing on the wind, and there I saw that person speaking in tongues, and then like a fire, like a fire jumps from tree to tree. It jumped to there, then jumped to there, then there and there, and then until, verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You know, I don't think God can much better way um, describe how if you've got 120, 120 people in a room and they receive the Holy Spirit, what a perfect way, when it's translated correctly, a perfect way to describe what's happened. And... And that's how they receive the Holy Spirit. You know, God says that God is not the author of confusion. If it were possible for, to receive the Holy Spirit in different ways, well, you've got 120 people there, wouldn't you think God would have 
said that in the scriptures. The first person received the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues. The second person gave his heart to the Lord, he received the Holy Spirit. The third person stood under a flag and he received the Holy Spirit. No, it doesn't say that. God said 120 times, I received the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues. And then sadly, people want to take the gamble that you can receive the Holy Ghost uh, another way. Again, the, probably the most, as I said before, the classic example of um, a doctrines of men that's taught as a commandment is that you can receive the Holy Spirit some other way. You know, they're, they're gambling their whole eternity on the scripture that they received the Holy Spirit and didn't speak in tongues. But it's not there in the Bible. And, you know, it's always... You know, we talk to people and they will say, well, you prove to me that you have to speak in tongues. And um, there's in the, in the um, legal term, legal field with lawyers, they have arguments, and God, that's been our greatest argument. But in the, in the legal realm where they have arguments, there's things called the, the burden of proof and the benefit of assumption. One's a, one's a burden, one's hard to do, and one's a benefit. And it's where we get, you know, a man is assumed innocent until proven guilty. So the burden of proof must be proved without uh, a shadow of a, a doubt. For example, the sun rose in the east, just over the East House meeting, and then set later on, much later in the west. Another house meeting is. But if you were to say, well, no, I believe the sun tomorrow is going to rise from the west and set in the east, then you've got the burden of proof because it's, it's really, it happened once, or more than once, lots of times the sun goes east to the west. So that's, that's the benefit of assumption it's happened. So we can assume it's going to happen again. That's the benefit of assumption. If you think it's going to go the other way around, you've got the burden of proof. You've got to prove that somehow something's happened, you know, the rotation of the earth is reversed or whatever, you've got a burden of proof. So we haven't got the burden of proof when we're talking to people about what happens when we receive the Holy Spirit. The first people, not just the first person, but the first 120 people received the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. Therefore, it can be assumed that's what happens. God's the author, he's not the author of confusion, Bible says that um, be wearless your minds, be corrupted from the simplicity of Christ. God, as we read here, has done a perfect example of people receiving the Holy Spirit. And that's what happens. That's the benefit of assumption. They've got the burden of proof. Now they've got to find that scripture where someone received the Holy Spirit and didn't speak in tongues. And of course, it's not there. Let's go on. Just moving on quickly. Now, back to verse Kings, chapter 18. So this wonderful miracle happened. The fire of the Lord came down and consumed the sacrifice in verse 39. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. He is the God. And when we have that fire from heaven, it comes down upon us in the form of the Holy Ghost, and we receive the Holy Ghost, we speak in tongues. It's not just the speaking in tongues. We get this, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Jesus spoke of that in John 14. He said, at that day, you shall know that I'm in the Father, ye in me, and I in you. You'll know. That's that, the Lord, he is God. The Lord hears God experience. You'll know a miracle happens. We heard it in our testimony today. We hear it nearly every time. I received the Holy Spirit and I knew that God is true. That's that. The Lord hears God. The Lord hears God. I received the Holy Spirit. My first thought was, wow, it's true. The second thought, I've got to tell someone. In Romans 8, it says, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. So not only when we receive the Holy Spirit, 
it's the Holy Spirit inside that is, of course, doing the speaking in tongues. We're not doing it. It's using our, our organs. But it's the Holy Spirit that's giving the utterance. And as it's doing that miraculous experience, as we've all um, know, at the same time, it's the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to our spirit, our man spirit, woman spirit. We are sons of God. Again, it's that. The Lord, he is God. Lord, he is God. Again, vitally important. Because in the man-made churches, they haven't got that. They haven't got that experience. Verse 40, just warning down now. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And you find you know, in our, our fellowship, we're based on the word of God, where God confirms what we're saying is true. You can have this experience where you can know for yourself that we don't have any Baal influence in our fellowship. You won't see any crosses, any man-made religion ideas, any crosses, any stained glass windows. You won't see our pastor wearing a white lacy frock with a fish head because I can't, no, I can't imagine that. You won't see all this man-made religious paraphernalia. But what you will find is, is uh, servants of God that preach the gospel and God confirms what we're saying, signs following with miracles where you can know what the true church is because you can have a personal experience, you repent, be baptised by full immersion, and you can have your fire come down from heaven, consume the sacrifice. You can have your experience receiving the Holy Spirit, you'll speak in tongues, and then you'll know the Lord, he is God. Lord, he is God. Amen. Thank you, Brad. We might get the band back up out the front.